Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> you want to know what one of the, uh, the best feelings in the world is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what it is. One of the best feelings in the world is when we complete a project or finish a goal or get something done. Don't you love it when you can get something done? Isn't that awesome? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I love it when I finish something, especially when it was really, really hard or really, really difficult or annoying and it's finally done. What's your first reaction when you finally finish something that you've worked really hard for? What do you do? Celebrate. Celebrate. Yeah, yeah. How about a sigh of relief? You ever felt that before? Just, just a, oh, it's done. Well, seniors, take your sigh. <laughs> it's done, right? It, it, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> We're proud of you guys. You, you did it. You, you might not have thought you could make it. You know, that one teacher that was driving you crazy, you didn't think you could make it through their class. I can't do one more day of this. And you've done it, right? Uh, the test you thought you may never pass, uh, some of you s somehow got through a class without passing that test. I don't understand that. But whatever it is, here you are, and you've arrived at this point. So uh, you get to take your sigh of relief. I, I take this sigh of relief a lot in my life. Uh, used to, that sigh of relief would come after an intense workout, right? And you get done, and you're finished, and it's that moment where you go, oh, and it's all over, right? Now it's just a sigh of relief when Jude finally falls asleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the sigh has changed over the years, right? But the sigh is there uh, nonetheless. So seniors, you get to take your sigh. But can I say another thing? Parents of seniors, can you take your sigh of relief? Right? Yeah. Well done. You did it. You got them here. And you didn't kill your child doing it. Right? Uh, it probably wasn't always pretty. It probably wasn't always fun. But you made it. And uh, you should be proud. This is a day worth celebrating because of the place that you're at. Um, and so let me, uh, let, me, let me tell you what I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, this is the thoughts that came to my mind. Let me share a couple of scriptures. Listen to this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one of them gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And they do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Brothers... I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining for what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And all of us who are mature should take such a view on these things. And I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Scripture talks so much about life being like a race, doesn't it? These are the few that I chose to point out. But there's so many times in Scripture where he says, your life is like a race. And we're on this journey together. And he says, you don't run like others do. We run with a purpose. Because our reward that we're running for is not just a medal. It's not a place of position. We're running for eternity. We're running for our eternal home. And the stakes are high. Uh, I love watching track a lot more than I like running track. Anybody else there with me? 
Uh, it's a fun sport to watch, for sure. And uh, it can be a, a, a really rewarding sport to participate in. Uh, I kept running anyway, even though I didn't always like it. But there's something about when you get to the end of a, a long run and you take that sigh of relief. And people say, why do you keep running? Aren't you miserable? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's that fulfillment that comes when you finish that long run, right? And, and uh, that's, I guess, what kept me going. So uh, even though the journey wasn't always fun, there was satisfaction at the end of every run. So when I was in high school, I was in track. Uh, I was in cross country and then in track as well. But one of the races in track that I participated in was the 400 meter relay race. And so the 400 meter relay race is there, basically it's this, there's four laps that your team has to complete and there's four runners to run the laps. So do the math. One lap per person, right? And so running a, a lap around the track doesn't sound that difficult, but you're having to give it everything you've got, right? And so I love this race. I liked it better than other races. I ran cross country. I enjoyed that too. Uh, but I didn't like the races that you had to run a long time around the circle over and over again. If I'm going to run around the track, let me do it one lap. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that's what I did. And uh, there was something in the race called a baton. Everybody know what a baton is? If, if you don't know, let me see, let me get a, a microphone that kind of looks like a baton. It, it kind of looks like this. All right, and so you hold the baton and you're running with the baton. If you watch the runners, they're running with the baton. And there's this moment where they're getting to the end of their lap and the next person's beginning and they don't just cross a line and the next person starts. They have to pass the baton to their teammate. And when they hand off the baton, their job is now complete and the one who's grabbed it, it's their turn to take off running. And there's a, there's a section of the track that you have to pass the baton in. You can't get too far and you can't be, you have to at least hit the line, right? So there's this moment where you pass the baton. Um, and, and there's a lot with that. Have you ever watched YouTube and seen some of the most tragic handoffs that are there? Uh, I was watching it. There was one team they were obviously predicted to win. They were amazing. Uh, it was uh, the Olympics, the track stuff they were doing, and the team was killing it until they got to the handoff. And they dropped the handoff multiple times, right? They fumbled it all. And because they fumbled the handoff, because that transition was not smooth, they lost the race, even though they ran the hardest and ran the fastest and trained probably harder than other people. It didn't matter because they failed in the handoff. Isn't that interesting? I think there's something there for us as well. Um, now, in passing the baton, li literally, I, I ran track, I ran the 400 meter relay. There was a lot of things, there's a lot of technique in running if you didn't know, right? Uh, in the way that your arms swing, the stride length, the way your foot falls, the way that you, you know, there's so many variables to running. But the thing that we spent the most time practicing was passing the baton. It drove me crazy, but our coach was like, you're not gonna end up on YouTube. <laughs> he said, I will not be that coach. Right? And so that was enough motivation for us. And so we, every day, would practice handoffs at the beginning of practice and the end of practice. In the middle, we would work on our running. But there was not a practice that we did not practice handing off. Because there's technique on both sides. There's not just technique in handing the baton. There's technique in receiving the baton. And, and so what the person running out front has to do is to reach as far back as they can in their runner's position, and they start getting a little head start, but they still have their hand out as they're running. The one behind has the baton. They're giving it everything they've got. They can't slow down too early even though they're exhausted because they've got to help this other runner get his head start as well. And when they place the baton in the hand, it's no gentle place. It's a slap, right? I call it a firm slap. You smack it into their hand. And then they grip that baton so tightly. And then the transition happens. Right? And, and all of those moments are vital in not dropping the baton.
When I think about important Sundays as a preacher, there's a lot that come to mind. Typically, Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day are kind of the big ones, right, when you think about big Sundays. But I think the most overshadowed and possibly the most important Sunday is Senior Sunday. It's this one right here, and I'll tell you why. We have a phrase in ministry. Uh, we, we talk about being there for people in ministry. You need to be there to hatch them, patch them, and dispatch them. <laughs> right? When they're born, when they're sick, and when they die. And we're there through all of that. Why? Because each one of those things are transition moments. And transition moments are so important. But the reason I say this Sunday is special is because on days like Easter and Christmas, we come together because of what Jesus did. But on Senior Sunday, we come together because of what God's doing in our life right now. We come together because we're in a transition moment. And so every senior in here, you're in that transition moment at the same time. See, transitions happen at different times. That's why ministry is tough. Because some of you, you're in a great season of life and nothing's changed. But some of you, everything's changing right now. But on Senior Sunday, I get a lot of people in the transition all at the same time. Every parent, every grandparent, every friend of a senior, every sibling of a senior, and every senior yourself is into this transition. And if we don't, listen to me, if we don't pass the baton well, it doesn't matter how strong you've run until this point. If you don't get the right start into this next chapter of your life, it's going to be very hard to make up for it. And so as tired as you are, as much as you want to just take your sigh of relief, you should. You've earned it. But at the same time, there's still some things you have to do. Very quickly, let me tell you a couple of what I've put down. Uh, by the way, think about Scripture for a second. This is a very, Transitions are a very scriptural thing. Most of the time when you think of a story of someone, they're caught in transition, right? God shows up every day, but he really shows up in the transition, and it's in the moments of transition that people's faith either crumbles or it's strengthened. So which will yours be as you move into this season of your life? It's one or the other. Uh, I've got some other things, but we're going to move on from there. Let me tell you what I wanted to, to share. Seniors, this is for you. It's your turn to take the lead. It's your turn to run. Right? People have been running for you. They've taken their lap for you. They've drug you to church. They dragged you to school. They probably still drag you out of bed every now and then, right? Uh, uh, they, they cook for you. They pay for you. But now it's time for you to take the lead. It's time for you to do some things that you might not have done. And for some of you, being out on your own is really exciting. Uh, for others, it's terrifying. And for most of you, it's somewhere in the middle, right? But whatever you feel about the next chapter of life, it's time for you to take the reins. So one thing is you got to lead, take lead in your own health. Stay healthy. Don't cook ramen noodles in solo cups in the microwave. Okay? <laughs> it's a bad idea. So uh, I don't know where that idea came from. It's not like I would do something like that, guys. <laughs> you got to take care of yourself. Uh, uh, your mom's not going to do your laundry, right? You got to do your own laundry. There's some, some responsibilities you got to take. But not only that, but you got to lead in your work ethic as well. You got to choose to wake up and say, I'm going to make the most of today and make every day count. Nobody else is going to do that for you. If you just want to sit around and be lazy and stay in your bed all day, nobody's there to say, hey, get up. Right? You've got to take the, the rein on that. But most importantly, it's time for you to lead with passion in your faith. You've got to want your faith to grow more than anything else. You've got to make a pact that says, I will grow in the Lord. And you've got to have that deep desire. You know, one of the most frustrating things, I was talking about track, one of the most frustrating things was when we got a guy on our team who didn't run fast. It drove me nuts because he was dragging the rest of the team down. Now, the problem was this. This is why I was angry. Not because he was slow. I was angry because he was fast. But he ran slow because this guy was also on the football team. And the coach said, I want you to run track so that you can stay in shape. But the coach said, I don't want you to run so hard that you hurt yourself. You need to take it easy. 
And so they put him on our relay team. And we would do great and have great times until it's his leg to run. That's what we call it, the leg, right? It's his leg. It's his lap. It's his turn. It's his moment to take the baton. And he would take things so casually he didn't care. And he would run so flippantly. And it drove me crazy. So we eventually replaced him, thank goodness, with another guy who was much slower but cared so much more. And I would take that guy every day of the week because he had a heart that said, I've got a mission and I'm going to be faster every day he got there. And he worked his tail off. And let me tell you, that guy, I would take him every day of the week, right? And our, our time as a team got so much faster because he ran with purpose. Paul says, I, I run this race, but I don't run it flippantly, right? I run it with intentionality, and you have to do that too. It's your turn to be intentional in your faith. So what that means is this. A 2017 study shows that two-thirds of teens will drop out of church when they go to college. Two-thirds of teens. So here's my challenge. Don't be another statistic. Don't let that happen to you. And here's how you do it. One, you got to stay connected to your church family. Okay, so parents, this is your message. You're not done yet. Okay, you, you've gotten to this point, but you can't just say, hey, I've raised you 18 years. Here you go. That's not how you pass the baton. You still got to run. You've got to firmly slap that, that, that baton down in their hands, sometimes a little hard to say, hey, right? Uh, do what you're supposed to. Uh, but you, you've got to put it down with intentionality. What that means is you've got to go to their school with them. You've got to go and find the church that they will be a part of with them. You've got to go see what this looks like. You've got to pray over them. You've got to help them move in. You can't just say, you're out on your own, good luck, and, and walk away. As much as you think that might be helpful, it's not. Don't do it that way. You help your kid find their space and their people and their church family. But for the seniors... You've got to choose to find those same people. You've got to go looking for your church family. You've got to make your faith a priority. Most people, listen, here's the deal. Most teenagers don't go to college saying, I'm going to go party and lose my faith. In fact, a statistic in the same year of 2018, Alan, I promise this is where I'm wrapping up. Uh, the same, same statistic, 80% or excuse me, 20% of teens that lose their faith lost their faith and knew they were going to lose it before they left. So 20% of people say, I'm done with this. Once I get out of here, I'm done with church. And so if that's you, I'm not even talking to you this morning because you've got a whole nother sermon that you need, right? I can't cure indifference. Jesus couldn't even cure indifference. He said, well, I just shake the dust off my feet. So if that's you, you really need to do some self-examination. I want to talk to the other 80% of teens who say, I'm going to go to college and keep my faith, but then lose it. All right? For those people, here's what happens. It's not intentional, but they just slowly drift away. Little by little by little. Because they weren't intentional with their faith. They were so busy with courses. Who's my teacher's going to be? What club am I going to be in? Who are my friends going to be? You've got a lot of things to figure out. But you better make faith your top priority in all of it. Where's your church home going to be? Who's going to hold you accountable? you got to figure those things out. Um, I had some other things I want to share, but uh, I don't want to take up any more time. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a moment to honor these teens. I'm, I'm so proud of you guys. I know Alan is. He's got some Bibles that he's going to present. So Alan, come on up, and uh, he's going to lead us in this presentation now. Thanks, Nathan. And certainly, I'm going to use this. I'm not like Nathan. Uh, certainly exciting time for y'all. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite Sundays. Uh, it's also a, a sad Sunday for me because, I mean, I've gotten to know y'all for, what, quite a while now. Um, and, you know, losing uh, people. Of course, I still have y'all through the summer, but it's, it's always hard. Uh, but I, I like this Sunday because it's, it's worthy of honor and recognition. So that's what we want to do this morning. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite our, our shepherds to come up to the front. Uh, while they're coming up, I uh, just want to give you all a rundown or a brief overview of, of, of the Bibles that, that we have. So a few years ago, I was challenged by the part in our vision that says uh, that we seek to be a people who hold to the Word of God and to prayer. And so I thought, you know, how, how can our youth group do a better job of that? And so I reached out to, you know, other youth ministers and say, hey, what are y'all doing? And uh, all ministry is stealing other people's ideas. And so that's what we did. 
<laughs> so what we did was we uh, started, started a new Bible initiative project, and uh, I purchased an NIV Journal of the Word reference Bible for every teenager in the youth group from 6th grade to 12th grade. Uh, I wrote uh, each teen's name in the Bible, uh, color-coded them by grade. Uh, their Bibles stay in the brick house at all times uh, so that they're ready for use in our, in our Bible classes, retreats, at events, activities, everything we do. I pack them up, take them with us. They always have their own Bible present. Uh, along with that, I also supplied them with you know, special pens and highlighters so they can write, make notes, highlight things, uh, favorite passages, things that uh, they want to remember down the road. And the more they participate in this, the more meaningful it will be in the future because once a student graduates and leaves the youth group, they're then given the very same Bible that they use throughout their whole youth time in our youth ministry. And so it uh, has a lot more meaning to them. Uh, th this, I believe, is our fourth graduating class to be gifted uh, their Bibles. And it's really neat to see uh, how year after year they, they get more worn down, you know, the, the straps get broken off or the pages are so worn down. And, and that's, that's what I really like to see because it means our teens are, are um, investing their time in, into the Word of God. Uh, so these are your Bibles now. You get to keep these. You, they don't stay on the shelf in the brick house. They, it's your responsibility to, to, to bring it and use it. Uh, so I'm going to call your name, and we've got some slides that, that will show, show some people. I think we're missing a few this morning, but that's okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, invite Rebecca Borio. So Rebecca is graduating from Hendrickson High School, uh, plans to attend Midwestern State University to pursue a degree in, in dental hygiene, where she hopes to become a dental hygienist. Uh, also, while in college, she uh, will work on staff at Camp Blessing. Uh, next is, I don't believe she's here, Abigail Guerra. Okay, uh, she's not here. We want to honor her as well. Uh, and Ethan Helmer. So Ethan, real quick, is, is graduating from Leander High School, plans to start work as an electrical apprentice before going into trade school to become a certified electrician. Jonathan Hill. Jonathan is graduating from Vista Ridge High School, plans to attend, first attend Austin Community College before transferring to the University of Texas in Austin to pursue a degree in accounting, uh, where he plans to become a CPA, work for partnership at a, a firm. A Deloitte, is that right? Nice. Uh, Conagher McGee. Conagher is graduating from Tom Glenn High School and plans to attend Texas Tech University to pursue a degree in natural resource management and conservation, where he'd like to do something in range management. I'm not sure what that means, but that sounds like fun. <laughs> and lastly, uh, Ethan Robledo. I think he's here. Uh, yeah, you can applause for him. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, he's also graduating from Tom Glenn High School and plans to attend ACC, after which he just wants to work on cars. So uh, that's our class of 2022. Let's give them a round of applause again. All right, for y'all up here, uh, I've just got a few things I want to say before I ask Kenny to pray over y'all. Um, so y'all listen up good. Uh, I know it's a time you've looked forward to for, for a long time now, and, and um, high school will soon be in your rearview mirror, and there's a lot of really good things to look forward to as you enter this next phase of your life. And, but it is an important phase. Uh, the habits and patterns you set in your life right now will have a long lasting effect for better or worse. Um, you're gonna be faced with a lot of choices, the decisions of which uh, you'll have to face mostly on your own. So I have some unsolicited advice uh, for you as you prepare to enter into this new phase. And, and a lot of it goes with what Nathan said. Uh, first is choose your friends wisely. I've always said, you, you become the product of who you surround yourself with. While we're called to love everyone we encounter, you need to be careful about who you are inviting into your life uh, to ensure they're the kind of friends who will build you up instead of tear you down. Second, choose who, choose who and what you listen to carefully. Uh, as Nathan so eloquently says, you spill what you fill. Uh, you will ultimately become what you decide uh, to watch or who you decide to listen and follow. Now, there are a lot of things in this world that sound good and pleasant, but eventually lead you astray. I urge you to stay connected to Christ as your foundation and, and discern all things with him in mind. And lastly, 
finally choose to pursue your relationship with Christ. It's up to you now. Your parents aren't going to force you to come here anymore. It's, it's up to you, as, as Nathan pointed out. Um, so choose to make Christ an important part of your life. Uh, and in all these things, trust in God. May he be the guiding light in your life and the source of your light as you shine uh, his light in the darkness. Uh, our theme verse for our youth ministry is Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. So while I and we are saddened to see you leave, we're excited about the many opportunities you have in this next phase of life as you seek to shine your light in the darkness. I'm going to invite Kenny to say a prayer of blessing over you all. Pray with me, please. Dear Father in heaven, we praise your name. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, so that we could have forgiveness of sin. We pray, Father, that you always keep that thought in our minds. Father, we come before you today to celebrate the graduation of these six young people. Father, we lift up to you the names of Rebecca Borio, Abigail Guerrera, Ethan Hilmer, Jonathan Hilt, Connor, Conagher McGee, and Ethan Robledo. Father, we pray that you watch over them, that you bless them every day with your watchfulness, that you protect them, Father, from Satan. Father, we pray that you import on them your wisdom so they can make sound, rational decisions and judgments as they step from youth into young adulthood, Father. We pray, Father, that each day they're reminded that you are God and that the most important thing is that you are God and you sent your son, Jesus, to die for them individually. We pray, Father, as they go throughout their day, that they're mindful of that. That, Father, as they meet people who need to know the story of Jesus, they can say, hey, let's talk about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. We pray, Father, that you be with them through their chosen endeavors, whether it be school, trade school, or work. Pray that you watch out for them, Father. Father, they've come a long ways, and they've just started a new journey. We pray for their families, Father, the sacrifices their families have made for them, the love and caring that they've been shown by their families. We pray, Father, that they will have an even stronger relationship with their parents as they grow and realize how far they've come and how far their parents have brought them and led them. Father, we pray that you be with us as a church family, as we support them, as we think about them, as we pray over them, as we console their parents who so many will suddenly find themselves as empty nesters. Help us to be available, Father, not only to the parents, but to these graduates as they need help. Father, in all things, we praise your name, and we lift up this prayer in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Give him another applause. And y'all go sit down now. Uh, before Nathan comes up, I've got uh, a passage of scripture I want to read. Uh, and this is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 9. It says, Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If, he, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can anyone keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So, um, as we close, parents, one more message for you. I know I told you earlier, your job is not to let go too soon, um, to make sure that you hand this transition off right. You help them get plugged in and you see where they're going, but it's not your job to run the lap with them. You do have to let go of the baton at some point and watch them run. 
how, how weird would it be if, if two runners just kept holding the baton and kept running around the track together? <laughs> That's not, but I've seen parents who do that with their kids, right? And it, it, it slows everything down. And so this is that moment. You have to trust that God has helped you through your 18 years of parenting these kiddos. And you also have to trust that it's God's turn to be their father and to take care of them and for you to let them go. And even though that's a hard thing and a sad thing, it's a very exciting thing because you get to sit on the sidelines and cheer on your kiddos as they run. But, you know, as I was thinking about that passage that, that Alan just read, seniors, uh, there's a story that comes to my mind. And it's the story, you've heard me talk about it before, and there's this crippled man who's been crippled from birth. And it's a sad story, it's a tough story, until one day, Jesus is coming to town. And suddenly there's some hope for this guy. But he can't walk, so how is he going to get to Jesus? And there's these four friends that pick up his mat, and they carry him to the house where Jesus is, but they get there. You know the story. They get there. There's no place for them to even get into the house. It's so crowded. There's people everywhere. But this guy needs Jesus. Without Jesus, he won't be able to walk. He won't be able to function. He needs Jesus desperately. And so these four buddies, they don't get there and say, well, we can't get in. There's no way. No, they, they find a new way. And somehow they grab a ladder they pull him up onto the roof. They don't have any other way to get through the roof, but they start clawing with their hands to dig a hole so that they can lower their friend down through a hole in the roof and lay him down at the feet of Jesus. And I love this story because my mind goes to what did the, the man see who's on the mat as he's laying on the ground looking back up at his friend's lowering him down. And can't you see the sweat and the strain and the bloody hands of these men as they worked so hard to lower their paralyzed friend to the feet of Jesus? I mean, these guys are sweating, bleeding, grunting, and working. And then as it's finally done, I imagine they took a sigh of relief. And then they look through the hole. And as he's looking up, they're looking down. Can't you see him going, is he there? Is he there? What's, is, is Jesus talking to him? Is he ignoring them? Are they, are they kicking him out? What are they doing? Like they want to know and they're, they're trying to see through this hole. And the scripture says, Jesus looks up. He sees the man. He looks up and he says, friend, your sins are forgiven because of their faith. His sins were healed because he had friends who when he needed Jesus most carried him no matter what through sweat, blood, and tears to the feet of Jesus. Those are the kinds of friends that you need to surround yourself with in this time. Of all the things that I can say for you, I'm, I'm proud of you. I know that you can do this, but you cannot do this by yourself. You're going to have more freedom than you've ever had. You're going to be alone more than you've ever been alone. But because of that, you need to take the charge to say, I'm going to surround myself with people because you're going to find yourself in crippling situations. Right? I wish I could say this is the start of a race that's just easy and you're never going to fall and never going to trip, but that's not how it goes, right? Life is tough. Things will be hard and there will be excitements too. But when in the, the times get tough, make sure you've put yourself in a community of people who say, Becca, when you're struggling, Conagher, when you're struggling, Jonathan, when you're struggling and your faith isn't where it should be, and you're not living the way that you should, get on your mat, bud. We're taking you to Jesus. And we'll carry you. But you have to create that group. It won't just happen on its own. I'm proud of you guys. I'm excited for you. Let's give one more round of applause to our seniors. Uh, typically, I would just jump into an invitation, but I want to end with one more prayer over these, these kiddos, so let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are and all that you do for us. And God, I thank you for uh, the, the, the transition moments in our life. The big moments where, where the baton has to be handed off and, and, and new doors are open as old doors are closing. And there's so much excitement and so much anxiety, especially now over our seniors and their families as they move into this new chapter. But God, I just pray that you bless them. God, give them so much joy. Give them so many awesome memories. Help them to find so many wonderful friends. But God, help them to grow in their faith. 
as they take this step. God, thank you so much for Alan, who has poured so much into these kids. Uh, I get to work with him every day, and it's such a blessing to see his passion for wanting these kids to succeed. He loves them so dearly, and there's been so many times where we've had conversations, and, and he just says, man, I just want them to get this. I just want it to be good. I just want it to go well. Uh, he really cares about them. So God, I pray a blessing over him and Tracy and Caleb and Shelby and their whole family. God, thank you for bringing them to us, and thank you for their work uh, that they do. God, it doesn't go unnoticed. We love you, and we are so excited to see how you bless the, this transition time for all of these guys and girls. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, and the church said... Amen. Amen. Uh, the lesson's yours. Think about it. If you need to respond, won't you come now as we stand and sing?